Hi, and welcome to the TIFF Industry Conference. My name is Chris Dunn. I'm a production consultant at Ontario Creates. Ontario Creates is an agency of the Government of Ontario, and we facilitate economic development, investment, and collaboration in Ontario's creative industries, including the book, music, magazine, film and television, and interactive digital media sectors. Over the last year and a half, I've been privileged to work closely with a group of dedicated advisory committee members and other partners to develop and launch the Ontario Green Screen Initiative. And I'm happy to be here today to moderate today's session titled Building a Greener Industry and How Can We Create a More Sustainable Future? This discussion today is co-presented by Ontario Creates and Telefilm Canada, and we're thrilled to be collaborating with Telefilm on this important conversation. I'd like to thank Anne-Marie Picard and her team over at Telefilm who've been driving the force between, behind getting this panel set up. So thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Before we get started today, it's important that we pause and acknowledge that the land that we're gathered on is a traditional meeting place for many Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. Ontario Creates Office exists in Toronto and is upon the traditional territorial lands of nations including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that these nations were the original stewards, the original caretakers and knowledge keepers on the land, and the original storytellers, and we're very privileged to work, live, create, and convene here. I'd be remiss not to point out that the original stewards of this land also understood the importance of respecting the land, nourishing the earth, and in doing so, the earth will provide abundance. Our industry is at a turning point, and I believe that we can learn a lot from the original inhabitants. Now, because this panel is virtual and has the potential to be watched anywhere in the world, I would urge everyone tuning in today to take some time to find out what traditional territorial lands that you reside upon. You can find out more by visiting nativeland.ca. When I think about the film and TV industry, I see a group of talented, passionate, creative, inspired individuals who are working to entertain, inform, change perspectives, tell stories, and push boundaries. Pushing boundaries is what we do as an industry. The next boundary that's being inched or pushed forward is the, is the boundary of responsibility, social responsibility, and the responsibility of sustainability. It's all of our responsibility and it's our, respons it's our obligation to make things better for not just for us, but for future generations. And with the recent news of the UN report that came out, that we're likely to, to exceed the 1.5 Celsius cap and could see temperatures rise to 2.0 to 2.7 by 2040, it's almost incomprehensible to think that it's on our doorstep. But we see it right now with floods and wildfires raging across many parts of the world. Right now, the film industry has a unique opportunity to make significant changes in the way that we create, the way that we interact with the natural world, and to reimagine an industry that takes into consideration energy consumption, waste, and excess. Many of the large studios have already implemented sustainability policies and are laying the groundwork for systemic change in the way that we do our work. Governments have begun to mobilize and collaborate to help one another in this unified goal. As an example, Ontario Creates and Creative BC have been working together and have brought together all provincial partners with Canada's first National Sustainability Committee. And for years now, the Sustainable Production Alliance has been working towards the unified goals of providing the necessary tools and resources to help producers manage their impact and make better choices. Here at home, producers are making it known that green practices aren't just personal choices, they're the way that we carry out our business. And broadcasters like CBC have launched their Greening Our Story strategy. So with this shift, I do believe that collectively we can succeed in turning the tide and making our industry not just a leader in entertainment or creativity, but also in sustainability, but it's a big idea. And it starts from all of us taking one action at a time. So today we've put together a panel of esteemed industry leaders who've been implementing sustainability into their workflow for years. They'll provide insight into tactical uh, know-how so that we can make changes in, in our workflow so that we don't have to co compromise the quality of the narrative or the stories that are being told. Sustainability can make business sense and this group knows how to do that. It's my privilege today to introduce you to Melanie Dubois, who's a producer of Nemo Films based in Montreal. Doreen Manuel is the director of the Boston Centre for Film and Animation at Capilano College in British Columbia. John Rego is the VP of Sustainability at Sony Pictures Entertainment based in Los Angeles. 
and Marianne Waterhouse is the EVP of Content Creation at Peacock Alley Entertainment in Toronto. Welcome to you all. Like every moment in history that's developed into a groundswell of support, these things start small. Their ideas, their concepts, their feelings. I would say that sustainability within our industry has begun this way as well. And at this time, we're starting to see a larger shift in our thinking, but it all started from a small idea. So I'd like to kick off the conversation by looking back in time. Um, and in the last few years, how has sustainability changed the way in which we do our work and in, which, in the way that which you've done your work? What small things have you implemented that over time grew into more substantive changes, practices? And how have you embedded these ideas into your processes and, and your workflows? So I'd like to start off the conversation and ask Melanie to join in. And then after that, please, all the other panelists, please join in if you feel fit, uh, feel free to do so. Hi, Grace. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, to uh, answer your first question, um, I think it all, before it all came from personal values and efforts of each team members, uh, we would gradually see less plastic on set, less toxic products, less printing, less waste, more recycling, and giving uh, access to communities. Uh, it worked, but in front of the environmental urgency that we see right now, the agreed standards of our productions had to be pushed higher and faster. Uh, we wanted to be able to measure and push our, our, our objectives a bit further on each set, um, and we didn't have a follow-through to see what improvements we had. So we wanted to build on something, and we had no concrete way of, uh, uh, to measure our efforts. So for this to be possible, we found it was important to have an infrastructure that would tie all the industry together. And that's how we contacted the Quebec Film and Television Council. They were already planning some stuff on their side. And there was the Conseil Québécois des Événements Éco-Responsables, who were a big support as well on our set, La Déesse des Mouchafeurs, which was a, the first pilot for the and kind of uh, setting, we're trying to, this project to set up uh, some just to collect data and try to have a more like norm, just a start, to, somewhere to start. Um, so they studied and analyzed our environmental impact to propose improvements. Uh, they collect information on our data to compare our improvement from productions to the other. And they, the most important part, they index one, uh, they index in one place the green resources, suppliers, and um, they help us to figure out how to manage, recycle the uh, and recycle and um, the waste. So uh, our, our research would be simpler and faster because you, we all know it goes really fast on set. So we wanted to have access to all of this very easily for all producers. Um, first step, there were already uh, natural ambassadors on set. So th that was a, a, an easy way to build on to distribute and communicate information throughout the set. Um, there's the, produ the production, that, uh, there's the director and the all heads of department. Uh, they needed to have access to the latest sustainability documentation, documentation uh, to be able to guide their, their team and reinforce what was already a common value. So a great solution was as well to have a green coordinator at the very beginning of soft prep, um, measures according and, 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 and just apply measures that were according to the, produ uh, the production specific need for the project because every project is different, every project has different places where we have to be careful. Um, we now have in Quebec a guide that's called Anton Vert. Uh, production have a selection of simple requirements by departments to choose from to get a green accreditation for their production. Um, so that helps a lot. We can talk about it later. Um, but we realize as well that um, ecology needs economy. Um, Personal, my, that's my personal conclusion. Uh, for the future, I feel that government and institution need to help the production by compensating the cost of extra time and equipment value. If production, if production have a green incentive, it will become a standard. Um, to have a sustainable industry, we need financial resources like tax credits, uh, special funds or subsidies. Uh, like for example, with COVID-19, we had a percentage was given to production during COVID. Uh, why not implant this as a bonus to production that respects a certain level of sustainability? So that's pretty much 
the first step I would cover, and then we can go more into depth with uh, the other panelists. That's really great. I'm hearing a lot of a lot of um, a lot of conversation about um, about building the infrastructure and the resources and the tools that everybody needs. Would anybody else like to uh, join in to this uh, conversation? Yes, Doreen. The BOSA Center for Film and Animation has been working on these sort of issues for quite a while. Myself, being Indigenous, I've taken a, a leading role in uh, accepting all recommendations and suggestions that come from our students and faculty very seriously. So we have implemented a recycling bin quite a few years ago and it's in full use. Um, we started to use the uh, portable recycling bins. Uh, one of our students made that recommendation, so we immediately bought the bins and put them in use so that when the students do go on location, they have the bins handy and ready to use. Um, we keep everything as in-house as possible. We have four huge, fully functioning studios on campus, and our first years are required to film only on campus. We also are an incredible facility that is surrounded by forest and um, we have on campus we have a doctor's office, physio office. Um, uh, one of the rooms that we teach um, extended care health looks like an emergency room. So we have all of these different types of locations right on campus so our students don't really need to leave. By third and fourth year we encourage them to leave at least part of the time because they need to learn how to book locations off campus. So we have less travel. We also have a fully uh, functioning uh, prop and set deck room. We also carry all of our own equipment. So we have, you know, all of the state of the art sophisticated equipment and we provide it right there out of our building. Um, just before, oh, we also uh, recently started providing a full craft services kit so that the students are, are more encouraged to not waste, not use um, disposable products. And just before COVID hit, I had had an Indigenous designer create a Indigenous environmental seal. So it was supposed to be a green um, accreditation and we were going to have uh, prize incentives so that productions that pass this um, uh, criteria would earn the seal that would go on their film and they would earn prizes for being able to display that um, seal. But COVID hit and our whole production had to kind of really shift and change and we're really looking forward to getting back um, to some normality so we can implement, finally in implement our seal. And, and I, if I can add to, to what Dor Doreen's saying about the seals, I think, you know, I think the seals is a perfect example of that evolution over the last decade. Um, we've started having green seals about 10 or 12 years ago. And if you look at where those green seals have started and where they are now, they have evolved to show the progress in the industry. Back then, from a power perspective, we were just talking about tie-ins. We're still talking about tie-ins because those are important. I don't want to leave those behind. But now we're also talking about things such as batteries. Um, we're talking more and more so about full LED lighting packages. We're talking more about camera sensors that have the ability to have a broader range of light that allow us to, to complement all of the LED and the various types of sustainable lighting that has now uh, emerged on the marketplace and obviously there's there's things coming down the pipeline like virtual production so we'll continue to see those green seals and certification changes um, occurring in the, in the future um, but I, I also agree with what Doreen said around students um, we recently here also started a green film alliance with a, a number of film schools so a, a big part of the evolution is not only around productions that are going on right now and in, instituting sustainable practices within their day to day, but it's teaching this new method and the new way of what we're expecting around production for future producers, directors, showrunners, and, and, and all of those parts and pieces down to the grips um, and, and, and transpo coordinators on, on a production. Mm -hmm. It's it's really interesting. I mean, to, um, I, I think that there's a connection there to be made, John, between you and Doreen with the um, with the uh, the Green Schools Alliance, um, the Green Filmmakers Alliance, um, uh, which would be really great. And you know, talking about that piece of um, like uh, certification or, or or offering up a seal, 
Um, the next question kind of uh, is, is related to that in some capacity as well. So, in you know, a lot of organizations have taken you know strides to implement sustainability into their corporate mandates, and those seals can be part of that. You know, certification and things like that. Um, but we all know that this is really isn't enough. Um, so, in the next ten years or so, um, and ten years is uh, is the you know just the random uh, arbitrary you know time frame that we picked for this. What important steps need to be taken to further drive sustainability within our industry? I know this needs to happen sooner, but in 10 years, you know, pie in the sky, what do we need to do? So questions to ask here would be like, what can production do to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions? And what can vendors and suppliers do to ensure that products and services um, are, are sustainable or they're circular? And then, you know, finally, you know, this is a, a little a bit different from this uh, conversation, but what can consumers also do to ensure that the products that, that they're consuming, that we're consuming, uh, have been created with sus sustainability in mind. Um, so Doreen, would you like to start off on this conversation and then the other panelists can join in? Sure, what I'd really like to see is an app for carpooling to set because they're just, you know, we have these huge circuses, huge parking lots, and there's all these people coming from every direction. And you find out later that there's a large section of people there that are actually from your neighborhood. And, you know, when you're on smaller productions, we've done this where we just put it up on a board. We've had everybody in a production meeting and we just did a carpool chart on the board and figured out how we were getting, you know, to and from set, especially if there's limited parking available for, you know, these smaller productions that can't afford that kind of parking space. So somebody developed an app where it was just, you know, you just plug it in your address and it just automatically tells you who else is from that neighborhood that's on crew. And then you can just send out a notice and, and organize amongst yourself to get to and from set. Um, choosing locations uh, closer to proximity to, um, you know, for so, so to, we do this also in smaller productions, you tr because if you have to move location, that's an enormous, you know, ordeal. But if you're closer, especially on these talent to watch productions, we've actually sought out locations where you could be all in one little proximity where you barely have to move, and yet you're seeing a whole range of different, you, know, you get different um, environments and locations. You get really creative on these smaller shows. I'd like to see that creativity implemented with larger productions, and. Um, I'd like to see more vendors like the Vancouver Prop and Costume uh, where their pro product is online. You don't have to actually go there and you don't actually have to necessarily go pick it up. You can go online and book everything that you need and then it's packaged for you and then you could actually have it delivered. Um, saving the back and forth traveling. I'd like to see, um, you know, sustainable products marked and featured on websites. I like all of this learning that we've done through COVID about putting things online, implement it and expand it so that we spend more time online making all of these decisions and making all the purchasing and movement so that we physically aren't needing to move to go um, finalize and, and pick up the things that we need for the production. I mean, equipment can be ordered the same way too. And I think to a large part it is, but it should be done even more. But the real thing that I've been trying to actually push with people is the implementation of what Indigenous people call the feast bag. So it's a, it's kind of a, it's an innovative idea, but it's an idea that comes from Indigenous potlatching. When you go into any Northern community and it's starting to grow in a lot of other communities, there's a bunch of bags by, you know, an Indigenous person's door. And those are feast bags, and in each bag is a, a plate, a bowl, a cup, utensils, a takeaway container. And if you've come to visit and you don't have one, they always have extras, and they give it to you when they're on their way to go feast. And if everybody had that, if we had standard industry feast bags, then we wouldn't have to waste all of the paper and utensils that get wasted, and people would go home and clean and take care of those things themselves and come back to set with a fresh set. That's a great idea. That's a very neat idea. Um, that's, that's great, Doreen. Um, I loved every one of those mm -hmm. ideas. 
I um I think John already talked a lot about some of the other things, some of the the um you know you're the biggest thing that I and I agree completely, Doreen, with what you're saying that by traveling less, we you know we are going to reduce pa- reduce our power consumption. But I think that's a, one of the hugest things that we should be looking towards is is reducing our power consumption. So what you said, driving less, finding your locations together. Um, but you know, looking bigger picture, um, when we can't, um, it's, it's obviously getting our vendors on board, you know, just speaking to what vendors can do towards uh, electric vehicles, electric trucks, eventually, um, and, uh, electric power supplies. I mean, that's, um, I tried so hard on this last production I just did to get electric power supplies to no avail, none available, just literally not available. Um, they've been designed, but they don't exist, um, in, in broad enough use. Um, so, you know, to me, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's my, I, I, what I heard from you, Doreen was like so much, um, the things we dream of. And that's the, the thing that I dream of is that I could, you know, that I could not use gasoline at all. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's what John said about tie-ins. It's also, um, it's, you know, it's all of, it's the vehicles and the power supplies and all of that and not having to use a drop of, of that oil, leaving that in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. No, so, sorry, Maria. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I, I mean, I no, think, no, you can go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I think, I think the, you know, the, the, our, our industry is fabulous and amazing, right? We, we work on a passion projects all the time with incredible creative minds. Um, the, the, the thing is, it's always on the move, right? It's unlike a traditional office or a manufacturer. So each player in the ecosystem is really important in that piece. Logistics still remains really important within the overall process. Um, I think you know, first we need to maintain what was a traditional mentality of the industry, which was a reuse. It's always been right. a reuse based industry and that still needs to stay at the core. Second, exactly what Marianne and Doreen were mentioning, right? It's large, the large impact is energy use. It requires more efficient electric equipment, but not only electric equipment, the ability to provide that electricity to that equipment in a renewable fashion, right? Not just traditional dirty power, but clean renewable power. Um, Zero emission vehicles, trailers, Um, vendors need to supply it, we need to use it. And I think what Melanie also mentioned beforehand is really an important um, um, inclusion into the conversation, which is ecology needs economy. And, and, and that's a critical yeah. part of the overall equation when we're thinking about this evolution. I do believe you know, virtual production as it continues to grow is a fascinating opportunity from a sustainability standpoint. Um, you know, it, it reduces the need to travel entire crews from location to cr- location. It brings some of those locations to a stage, which allows you additional control, certainly from an energy use and, and renewables perspective. And I think that I think that's a, you know something that we all need to pay attention to, something we need to continue to promote, but also make sure virtual production, as it evolves, is focused also on that renewable and clean portion of of, of the electricity that's powering it as well. Yeah, and there's, there's so many touch points in there as well, right? Like with in, in terms of vendors, I mean, it's the supply and demand question as well. And if the suppliers don't know that we, we would want this and that this is what we, we are requesting, um, then how are they ever going to change what they what they've delivered to us? Because we're always accepting what they what they've got. Um, so you know, if, if if people mobilize to say, well, this is these are the things that we want to have as an industry, and we have we have the power to do that as an industry. Uh, like for example, I'm thinking of with Ontario Green Screen, we're just about to launch our hybrid electric vehicle pledge for the industry to go to the, 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 the car companies to say this is the industry that rents a lot of vehicles from you and we want to rent hybrid or electric vehicles whenever possible and can you make that happen and those are the kind of shifts that will happen from the supply from the supplier side that can help kind of ch- change the shift of, of the types of vehicles and, and the type of equipment that we currently have and shifting it over to green uh, green, green products and services. There's been a lot of talk about COVID-19 in this conversation, um, which and and what's lots of changes that have happened because of COVID-19. Um, but with you know with the recent report from the IPCC, it's clear that we need to <clears throat> think about this. And there's you know it's that report is drastic, and there's the predictions are dire, and we need to mobilize now to avoid the worst possible consequences. In regards to COVID-19. On, on the other side of that, it's it's been inspiring to see the degree to which the industry came together collectively to ensure 
the health and safety of everybody on, 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 on set and that we were able to continue to create and develop our content even during one of the most challenging times that we've ever witnessed. Um, so coming out of COVID-19 and with the eventual recovery uh, of many sectors going back to work, what lessons do you think can be learned from how to ensure that sustainability is first and foremost as the industry as we kind of move back and move ahead? Um, Marianne, can you can you start off this this uh, this point? Yeah, for sure, because this is something that is very um, close to my heart. I mean, I I'm going to jump back a tiny bit and say that you know a year and a half ago when we were starting Ontario Green Screen and you know literally met on the same day the pandemic was announced by by WHO, um, it was it was it was horrible to see how the conversation just literally stopped. Right? I mean, it was like we can't think about this right now. To Dorian's wonderful carpooling idea, which I love, but it was like no, nobody get in the same vehicle with each other. Let's go back to single use. All those wonderful zero you know zero waste stores shuttered because no one wanted to share a, a cup um so you know i do I, I but i do think that there are so many things that now that we've lived with it for so long that we can take away there's there's the there's the base level things that you know john and doreen also both already mentioned the, the the use of virtual like the fact that we're doing this panel this way right now look at all the look at all the drives and the, the you know john didn't get on an airplane to get here doreen didn't get you know we're all together and all you all of you that are able to see this and experience it you're also not having to like you know, waste a bit of fossil fuel to, to, to see and experience this. And the fact that we've learned how to do that and we've all embraced it, that's, that's great. That's going to help immensely. And I, and I want us to hang on to that. I, I know seeing people in person feels good too, but you know, this is this, this tool that we've got now, we, you know, we need to embrace it and use it. But the thing that to me is the most actually exciting about what happened is what you, you said it, Chris, we changed. We literally changed the way that we worked and we did it really fast. Like it was, we were one of the first industries to be able to find a way to fully reopen, to mobilize like across studios, producers, unions, like, you know, that mobilization and the level of change that we did. And I've, you know, been trying to fight the sustainability fight for a while, always with the, you know, and I'm not you know calling one person out, but the gaffer or the DP or the, you know, there's somebody saying, nope, nope, that's not how we do it. Nope, that's not how we do it. We can't do it look what we just did we changed everything and um that proved to me that you you know there's there's no more telling no more telling me anyway that we can't do it um we need that report is well timed to tell us that this is now the time to take just as much take us just as seriously as we had to take COVID 19 and you know also we you know our industry was a leader in in you know in finding a way to to reopen safely i mean we i know that certainly the canadian government is very impressed with what our industry did i'm sure the american government is too i mean it's it's um it was masterful and that's because we are a pretty unique type of person um you know john already said that we are innovators we are problem solvers we have people that represent every different type of way of thinking you know creative thinkers mechanical thinkers like you know we we run the gamut so if anybody can come up with a plan it's us and so that that though and to answer the last part of what you said how do we ensure it happens like it it takes people like us and then all the people that are listening right here like it, it takes it takes every one of us doing it it isn't going to happen you know it's it's going to happen only because everybody participates um we need leadership like you know like you know, like Sony and the John's company is doing and the company that I work with a lot, Netflix. Um, we need leadership, but we actually need every single person involved the way that they were in dealing with getting back to work in the pandemic. You know, what's interesting is that um, just touching on what you had said about people not wanting to get into the same vehicle, you drive to set, you still have to take a shuttle from car park to set. So there's still carpooling part of the way but I mean and then touching again on on your thought about innovation there's an opportunity for somebody to in uh, to create invent some sort of um, um, temporary thing 
plastic thing that you can put into your vehicle. I mean, a lot of these uh, Uber drivers and taxi drivers put actual plexiglass in their vehicles to separate the front from the back, which used to exist a long time ago. Certain types of, um, you know, my daughter was on set and I was always scared that I might have to go pick her up. So I cut a piece of clear shower curtain to fit in my vehicle in the event that she got a positive test and I had to pick her up and bring, you know, bring her somewhere, I could pick her up and feel safe for myself. I mean, there's a lot of innovation that can come from necessity, which is something also that you touched on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's the, that's the necessity of uh, climate change now. That's the necessity that I want to I want us all to focus on. Yeah, in terms of mobilizing and how do we keep um, the how do we keep sustainability at the forefront? Um, you know, I, I know that a lot of <clears throat> a lot of companies and a lot of uh, producers have already they're thinking about this on a daily basis and they're implementing this. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about you know corporate policies on uh, on sustainability and, um, and and you know just the declarations as well? Like how important is it for for companies and producers and individuals to declare that sustainability is part of what they what they what they do and, and how they want to work in, in in this in this space? I think just like equity and inclusion, and people are making that you know. Uh, following truth and reconciliation policies is part of the actual Canadian government. You know, uh, it's in every area of the Canadian government's uh, mandates. And um, you have to have that kind of leadership, embracing those sort of values. And this is another value that needs, needs to be embraced. And they, if they show that leadership, I think they're going to get more buy-in from the great numbers of us who want that sort of leadership. Right. And and I must add something. Uh, we're in the the movie business, television business, and it's all about representation. So if you start showing acts as well that are different, mm -hmm. it's a huge part of what we do. We create what the ideology behind what pe people think. So um, just showing those green acts. Uh, just different way of doing. It's like no people smoking on screen, uh, showing more, more, more girls, more diversity. It's all part of like who we want to be as a society, as a collective group, uh, as a world. So um, I think it all starts by the image and what and images talk. So uh, what we show on our screens is is already a vote. So I guess um, that's my the reason why I'm in this business. And uh, yeah, I think Marianne wants to add it onto this. Well, I'm like, absolutely, Melanie, that's it. It's like, what mirror we reflect back on people, right? Like, I think I'm, I'm so just agreeing with you. Like, it's exactly it. And then, and then what's exciting to me is you asked a question earlier, Chris, and you said this is a different question, but what, what about the consumer and, you know, what their practices can be? And maybe you were talking about what they do in their day-to-day -day life. But what I think is there's the real, like, that's who we're, it's who you're talking, our audience is who we're reaching. Our odd, if our audience demands, and I think this is what you were saying, Doreen, if our audience demands that they're watching something that was made in a sustainable way, that, you know, that that seal or whatever is at the end of, you know, just like no animals were harmed. I mean, if our audience starts to demand that, and that's how, you know, that's the individual action, that back on us, you know, the Sonys and the, you know, will, you know, and the ones that aren't will have to comply. Like it's, it's circular, right? And, um, and I think what Doreen mentioned also about leadership agreed a critical signal what's going on. I, I'm, I'm deeply thankful for our CEO, Tony Vincicara and our CFO. During the pandemic, we launched our next five year plan and targets last summer, focused on a variety of different things, obviously climate and carbon being a central focus of it, but also some, something that on the surface sounds simple, but we all know is not simple of getting rid of single use plastics. So we have a target around that for 2025 also. The reason why I bring that up is Tony in the town halls, because as Marianne mentioned, everything's virtual. So the benefit is he gets to talk to all of our employees around the world on a monthly basis or, or, or more frequent as the, the schedule wants. He brings on his reusable water bottle and talks about our single use plastics, right? It happens within five seconds, over an hour, and it's fantastic. And it's that type of power that we have every single second of every single day. 
to connect with people. And it only has to be five seconds in a consistent way. Um, and people get the message and, and, and that's how those norms change and those expectations change. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's like, it's being accountable as well. Right. John, like you, you guys um, just released your, uh, <clears throat> your sustainability report card recently. Right. And it shows exactly what you've been doing and what your targets are and where you're heading towards. And I think that really shows that shows leadership in, in, in the industry that you're, you're moving towards targets and you know that it's not perfect and, and you'll iterate and make it better as you, as you move, move forward. Yeah. That's that's right. Yeah, we, we released our first for our, for our studio, specifically a studio report card to complement our sort of larger company disclosures that we've done for, for, for a while now. Um, I've been yeah, and and we got really fantastic um, response from the industry, Chris, from people like you in Ontario and British Columbia, US and the UK. Um, we actually created a pilot group of about 10 studios that is coming together to take sort of the lead building or, or Briam, if you're in the UK, building so checklist format and bring that into the studio world and say, how, what, you know, what is that baseline expectation for the studio? But by going through this process, how do we share best practices? How do we be transparent with this data around our climate improvement um, so we can challenge each other to continue to be better, share best practices, show the numbers and metrics to make sure we're, everybody realizes where they sit within that best of class. Um, so we have a friendly competition to continue to make progress. So we're very excited to what Albert is doing with us in the UK and, and we'll, that, that'll more information to come on that later this year. Mm -hmm. That's it's kind of a perfect segue into my next question that, <clears throat> that's talking about collective action and kind of tackling the ideas of sustainability in our, in our industry. Um, so collective action is something that we hear a lot about. Um, and collective action can really implement change, coming together and collaborating. Can, can you guys as a panel please provide some insights into <clears throat> examples that you've seen where collective action or collaboration has worked in helping to drive change within your organization, your production, um, within, you know, within, within the, the realms that you guys work in? Um, John, would you like to start off with that? Sure. I mean, the great, the great thing about our industry, I think there's no um, you know, lack of examples of collective action. I mean, uh, Ontario Green Screen is a fantastic example of that, right? Bringing, play, bringing people across the different components of our, of our, of our industry, the, the, the production, the content creation piece, bring them together to talk about this shared value, this, this sort of responsibility that Doreen was talking about, right? In one place to discuss what are the needs what are the gaps? How do we work together? Um, I think British Columbia has one, and and, and congrats to the, the to Canada for creating the National Sustainability Sustainability Committee. That is fantastic. Um, we've we've done that in the U.S. with the Sony, uh, it's not Sony, uh, Sustainable Production Alliance, um, here for about ten years. A group of studios. Again, um, we worked with uh, film schools such as AFI to, and and they did all the work. They launched uh, the Green Film School Alliance, which is another fantastic. Uh, example of collaboration, and you see that across um, other locations, such as in the UK, such as across Europe with the observatory, bringing all the film commissions together, talking about sustainability in an active way. Um, and that's, and you know, that's how we, you know, create shared best practices. That's how we set industry norms. That's how we sort of talk about training and make sure the training is consistent, but also occurring across all of these these locations with which we're shooting. Um, so everybody has that baseline of understanding of what do we mean when we say sustainable production. Great. Would anybody else like to join in to that conversation about collaboration and... I think it's essential, you know, in the Indigenous community, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how many people know this, but we always worked with consensus. We never moved ahead unless everybody was on board and everybody can get on board. and. One of the examples I can give comes out of my latest film, Unseated Chiefs, and it was back in 1969 when the Indigenous people were being attacked by Pierre, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and the Minister of Indian Affairs, uh, Jean Chrétien, with the White Paper Policy, which was a document that would um, end all rights for Indigenous people overnight. It would we would have ceased to exist practically overnight back in 1969 had they passed that policy. We would no longer be, there would no longer be Indigenous people in Canada today if that had gone through. And the Indigenous people together banded together across Canada and they had these different meetings. And in the 1969 meeting they had in Kamloops, British Columbia, 
they met and met and met until there was consensus. There was a huge group of youth that came in who misunderstood the document, hadn't read it carefully enough, and were in support of it. But the elders would not move forward, would not bash those young people. They just sat and talked and talked and explained the document to them clearly until they finally understood. And then the youth owned it. People can't own anything if they don't understand it. And in order for us to walk forward together as a team, we all must own our part of it. We all must acknowledge and understand and adopt and, and live those values. So for me, collective action is imperative. Absolutely. And, and under, understanding the issues and understanding what's, what's at stake is really important for us as well. Um, with you know Ontario Green Screen specifically, we we offer training for climate sustainable production training and carbon calculator training, so that people can get that baseline understanding of what what the issues are and how they can make kind of tactical changes. And it's building it's building that community by you know one training session by you know community meetings that uh, that we have on a quarterly basis where we can actually help build that community and and kind of help that change that momentum of change kind of move forward. If I can give another example, um, we had a green coordinator on ADS de Mouchafer, and that really helped out because people are, have really have the, the um, have been aware and willing to participate in being greener for years. Like that's not the issue; uh, it's more having being on the same page on what exactly are the right practice and what and have the right signs and have the it's all those things. It's it's very small things. But it's it really changes the entire d dynamic on a set, and it's it's time consuming if you don't have it because people are asking questions. They're around the bins and they're like, "Does it go in composting? Does it go in recycling? Does it go here?" They don't know. If you have like clear signs mm -hmm. and and someone responsible to actually guide people, people will follow. They have actually they're, they're actually really it's they're willing. They want to do what's best for the planet. That's not the, so. It's really just that's why that's why when I talk about infrastructure, uh, it's to just have an ally, alliance between all the industry that are in our industry. So the suppliers, everyone. So we're all on the same page, and that the technologies that because e every day there's new technologies, new studies that come out, and I feel like they're not always everybody's not on the same page on, on those. Me measures that are they're coming out and those and the, those um yeah those actions that we can, can that we can have every day so it's just making it simpler by uh right display um and people will follow yeah it's super important to have all of the tools and the resources available so that people can figure out what to do when they do when they want to do the right thing um in, in yeah, people, people are, it is, it, 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 it's, it, I so strongly agree. People just, they don't know what to do. They don't know what the step is to take. And, you know, going back to the COVID parallel, just remember how confused we were at the beginning of that and what was the right thing to do. Like, you know, we were told entirely different things day after day, yet still we figured out a safe path and modified it as we went. So, you know, I think we remember that there's a lot of confusing science still, but, you know, that is where the leadership is to do exactly what you're saying, Melanie, like make a set of, you know, a, a set of rules, maybe too strong recommendations, a set of a path, and then people will know what to do because it is, it's knowing what step to take, knowing what bin to put mm -hmm. things in. So in thinking about the, that question that you just raised, Marianne, about people not knowing what to do, um, I, I'm going to ask all of the panelists that are with us today to provide suggestions to our audience that's, that's viewing in today. Um, three or four things that we can do right now that can help implement change in our, in our workflow, in, in our production, in our studio, in, uh, in, in the projects that we're working upon. Um, so if I could start with Doreen to, and then go from Doreen to Melanie and to uh, Marianne and then to John. Um, I, I like this question because it again reflects back on Indigenous culture. In Indigenous culture, we start with the eye. If we look into the world and we want to see change, we look at ourselves first and we ask ourselves, am I living that change? We start to live that change. Our family notices and are admiring it and they decide to live that change. And that goes out to the community and then out to the nation. So I would suggest assembling your own feast bag to take to work and uh, reaching out to fellow crew to set up carpools 
and um, review your own crew position to find ways to protect the environment, set manageable goals, and adopt practices that can make any form of contribution, because we have to start somewhere. And uh, lobby the production you're working on to start the first production and the first day of production by hosting an Indigenous ceremony that speaks to care of the earth because we are the stewards of the land. We hold these values closely. I recently did that for an independent production and I volunteered to do it. And I went on, on set and I hosted a sm smudge ceremony and I talked about caring for one another because that's part of sustainability. And um, I also like the, I, I didn't do it with that particular ceremony, but I've heard of this being done where you hand out a colorful piece of ribbon or cloth and ask everybody to tie it on themselves and or on their work bag or some piece of something that they use every day for work so that they're, they have it every day at work. And it's a constant reminder that seeing that little, we used it with orange ribbons and it was to remind everybody of all of the mass graves that are being uncovered of residential school children who didn't survive. I personally am a residential school survivor who did survive. And so I know the horrors of inside of those walls and I know what those kids endured before they were murdered and put into the ground. And some beautiful production had had one of these ceremonies and everybody on set was wearing these little orange ribbons. And I really liked the idea. And when this topic came up, I thought we could have little green ribbons and use the same concept because it's a reminder. We see the green ribbon as we're holding something um, and we, we like a cup, you know, and wonder whether or not we should throw it away. Uh, and it, it's just that visual constant reminder. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Melanie? That was a very nice example. Um, I, I would say that for us, we, we build it the, the guide in Quebec. We, we build it the guide, the guide en ton vert. So there's actually like three levels of requirements. Like you can have the baby step number one, number two, number three. And then it's really sorted out as in departments. So each head of departments, it goes back to the training we, we were talking about earlier. There, it's really like point by point things you can do. And um, then you get points for the ones you achieve or not during your production. So that's really helpful because it's a to-do list. The production, like, we're not overwhelmed by this, like, extra big uh, department to, to you know, manage. It's already done, and it, we can take it to another production. And if the aspects of the film are different, it's fine. You have other points you can go and, and, and go get. So it's kind of a little game at the same time. So it makes it, makes it fun. Um, I would say that I'm, uh, I've been working in the art department for a long time too. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, we didn't talk a lot about the art department, but that's a huge uh, department that has a lot of waste as well, or could have a lot of waste if it's not managed properly. Um, and we, were, we had a lot of, uh, in Quebec, we were trying to have a lot of uh, reference as well and try to rent rather than buy, uh, less buying online, um, reuse, um, sell or give to school or to communities that like schools or uh, communities and anywhere in the in the community um, so that's big steps just generally and um, I would say that for the costume and um, costumes the same thing it's the um, it's trying to rent as much possible um, and for the makeup uh, it's it's uh, using products that are not toxic and people are asking more and more for it. The actors are asking more and more for it. So it's uh, makeup artists make their own makeup. So there's brands that are starting like that. So there's a lot of um, very various way of like just implementing some some steps from departments. So I would say that it's a very precise list you can have for every department to to go through. And uh, I don't know if there's an English version of it yet. Probably there is, but uh, it's called Anton Vert. It's the guide, and I, I would strongly suggest to people to have uh, to go and um, take a look at it just to have example of what they can do, even even if it's only in Quebec right now. Great, thank you, Melanie. Um, Marianne. Uh, well, I mean, I think building on what Melanie said, I mean, reducing waste. Um, that's you know, that's the kind of the low hanging fruit, but we're still not doing it. Number one thing is my suggestion uh, 
is getting, watch your waste, watch how it's being sorted and what's happening to it after it leaves your property, that it is actually getting to the right place. So that means making sure that you have a vendor that is sorting the waste and, and taking it to the, you know, recycling it in the right way. We found, you know, this, a few years ago, sadly, that that wasn't happening. We were doing all of our organics and they were still ending up in the landfill. So, uh, you know, get a vendor that's actually hand sorting. They, they exist now. We, we had one just on my last production, hand sorting everything that we gave them, even after our crew, hopefully put it in the right bin. So that's just, you know, ask if your vendor is doing that and stop wasting food. Food waste. This is the one that horrifies me the most, and it's because I also I'm I, I'm involved with Second Harvest and a, and a food bank is another thing that I do. You know, fifty eight percent of the food produced in Canada gets wasted. Fifty eight percent, and our sets are a place where that happens. So figure out a food rescue program, like get food rescue, at food pickup. You know, the food that you're not using, ensure that it gets you know to Second Harvest or any of the food rescue programs. Um, I think food rescue is huge. Um, and then on the other side, as we've already talked about, use less fuel. So drive less, just, you know, uh, just drive less, do more virtual meetings, carpool, as Dorian said, just drive less. And lastly, um, plug in. I know that's again, the low hanging fruit <laughs> until we get all the electric stuff though. It's what we can do. It's a thing we can do now. So just, you know, whatever role you're in, um, plug in. So. Great. Thanks, Marianne. And finally, last but not least, John. Yeah, I love I love everything that's been said. I, I don't have much else to add <laughs> except except be a champion on your production show. Right. Yeah. Be that champion, which really means start the conversation. If you want if you want to do something, ask, volunteer, say I want to do it. As Melanie was talking about, resources do exist, whether they know it at that moment or not. Resources exist locally pretty much in every production location you can imagine um, food donations resources exist and organizations exist in a lot of these locations with which to partner with around food donations but be that champion if you don't speak up it's not going to get done and if you if you speak up very good chance other people will also speak up and say yes i also am really interested in that I think Doreen's example around just that indication of I care, whether that's a voice, whether that's a, a ribbon, like that's that's really the critical part on these productions with which you're there for six or nine months and then you move on. You got you to gotta introduce yourself and introduce your passions. Great. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, everybody, for <clears throat> all of your input into this conversation today. It's been a really lively conversation and uh, it's really it, it's inspiring to see that there's so many things that we can do right now that can really help us make make that tectonic shift that we need to make. Um, so we're at time right now, but I did want to say thank you very much to Melanie Dubois, Doreen Manuel, John Rego, and Marianne Waterhouse. Thank you so much for joining us today. And for everybody out there uh, watching today, uh, please you know join in if you're interested in finding out more about uh, sustainability, come to ontariogreenscreen.ca. Uh, and uh, you can find out what we're what we're doing here in Ontario, um, as well as you know through SPA and through Real Green and through a number of different uh, initiatives uh, across the continent and globally as well. So thank you for joining today, and uh, we will hope to see you again.